uh, all you all on the behalf of the department of philosophy and religion uh, i bid a very warm welcome uh, to all the participants and esteemed guests who took out their valuable time time and joined us today to participate in this uh, saturday seminar lecture series uh, before i begin the session uh, uh, i would request uh, our head of the department to show our gratitude and respect to the founder of this uh, university um, and uh, sir uh, professor chaudhary uh, professor dubey and uh, please sir come and uh, garland the statue of uh, malavi ji बिफोर आई बिगिन द सेशन आई रिक्वेस्ट सूर्यकांत त्रिपाठी आवर डिपार्टमेंट रिसर्च स्कॉलर फॉर द इन्वोकेशन रिसाइटल सर्वेभ्यो नमः नमः नमो नमः वक्रतुंड महाकाय सूर्यकोटिम प्रभ निर्विघ्न कुर मे देव सर्वकार्यु सर्वदा ओम सर्व मंगल मंगलमंगल्य शिव सर्वाधिके शरण्ये त्रयंबिके गौरी नारायणी नमोस्तुते गुरुर्ब्रह्मा गुरुर्विष्णु गुरुर्देव महेश्वर गुरु साक्षात पर ब्रह्म तस्म श्री गुरव नम अखंडमंडलाकार व्याप्त ये नाचर तत्पद दर्शि ये नस्म श्री गुरव नम मातृवतलालयत्री चितृवत मगदर्शि नमस्त गुरुसत्ताय श्रद्धा प्रज्ञायुता चया कुंदेन्दुतुसार हार धवला या सुब्रवस्त्रवृता या वीड़ा वर दंड मंडित करा या श्वेत पद्मासना या ब्रह्माच्युत शंकर प्रवृति भी देव सदा वंदिता साम पा सरस्वती भगवती निहसेस जाठ्याम पहा शुक्ला ब्रह्म विचार सार परमा आद्यां जगद्व्यानी वीणा पुस्तकधारिणी अभयदा जाढ़्यांधकारा पहा हस्ते स्फाटिक मालिका विदधती पद्मासने संस्थिता वंदे तां परमेश्वरी भगवती बुद्धि प्रदा शारदा नमस्कार thank you so much uh, surekan for the recitation of uh, for such a wonderful uh, uh, blissful recitation um, now i would request our head of the department to facilitate our speaker uh, with shawl and garland thank you so much sir now i request our head of the department to deliver his welcome address hari yo respected professor rakesh chandra ji chairing the seminar 
our speaker dr rahul moria convener of the seminar dr priyanka misra our colleagues students scholars connected to the seminar i on behalf of the department of philosophy and religion welcome you all in the saturday seminar friends our chairperson today is professor rakesh chandra he is teacher of dr rahul morea who is going to present the seminar today professor chandra is a well known scholar of modern western philosophy as well as contemporary western philosophy he has been especially concerned with the philosophy of noji kan roti all we know that chandra is professor rakesh chandra is not only a man of philosophy but he is fully engaged with philosophy so it would be really very interesting to listen to his presidential remarks after the lecture of dr rahul morea who is going to present not only an overview of the philosophy of last 200 or 300 years back but he would like to see the philosophy in angle of roti and ice it would be really very interesting to listen to rahul i hope all of you would enjoy the lecture of rahul morea i welcome both the speaker and chairperson in this saturday seminar i also welcome professor dia gangadhar ji who is always with us professor geeta manakdala meera chakravarti ji k k misra ji prashant sukla ji rajkumar singh and many others who have joined the seminar online i welcome all those i welcome all those here present offline professor durgesh choudhary professor sc dubey ji professor pk bagre ji baleshwar yadav ji and the different scholars who are present here i welcome you all in the saturday seminar i hope you would really enjoy the lecture thank you thank you so much sir uh, for your uh, pleasant and warm welcome address uh now i am profoundly delighted to take this opportunity to introduce uh, the speaker for the day our friend and colleague dr rahul kumar morya uh, who will deliver a lecture uh, on from kantian enlightenment to rotian rights a pragmatic a pragmatist perspective 
Dr. Rahul Kumar Maurya did his uh, master from Lucknow University and obtained his MPhil and PhD from Jawaharlal Nehru University. Dr. Rahul has been engaged in teaching and research for the last seven years. He has also published several research papers in reputed journals. He has research interests in analytical philosophy, contemporary pragmatism, metaphysics, epistemology, logic, and ethics. Uh, before joining BHU, he has taught at the Department of Philosophy, University of Delhi, Janki Devi Memorial College, Delhi University, and Amity Noida. Uh, he is also doing one research for the project, uh, Anti-Foundationalism, Patnam, Roti, and Buddhism, awarded by BHU under the IOE Seed Grant. I welcome you, Dr. Rahul. Thank you so much for joining us today. And now I, uh, and now, um, I, it is my great honor uh, to pronounce that today we are joined by uh, Professor Rakesh Chandra, who hardly needs an introduction. Uh, Professor Chandra is currently a Dean of Academics at Lucknow University. He is a member of the ICPR uh, and was Dean of Student Welfare and has been the former head of the department. Um, Department of Philosophy and Director, Institute of Women's Studies, Lucknow University. He has been a consultant with UNICEF on primary education and child labor. He has been teaching for more than 25 years and has been the recipient of UGC and ICPR scholarship and is co-investigator of a UGC major research project. He has actively supported gender-specific program of UNDP, SIDA, EZE, Oxfam in India and Nepal. He co-authored the state plan for education in UP. He co-authored the UNDP gender report for UNDP in 2008 and authored the country report of the status of women empowered for DFID. So he, uh, he also prepared the gender development index for the special reference to the quality of life under the center of excellence scheme for UP in 2009. And he has uh, worked with Dalit communities for more than 10 years in Barabanki, supported a girl education uh, initiative. And sir has also written uh, multiple uh, 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 research articles. You know, I think some are very, you know, you know his uh, recent publication in includes, uh, like one book is very important, I think, uh, Domestic Violence Against Women in India. Uh, it was published by Madhva Books. And then one book, uh, Necessity, Identity, and Con Conceptual Structures, New Royal Book. So uh, I think uh, uh, without any, uh, we are honored to have you with us uh, uh, today. Uh, let's start the event without uh, further delay. I would uh, now invite uh, Dr. Rahul Maurya to the podium to deliver his uh, lecture. Uh, thank you, Dr. Priyanka. Uh, I'm really grateful to the department for giving me this opportunity to share my uh, research interests and philosophical thoughts. Uh, it is indeed an honor and privilege to speak in front of many of the senior professors, uh, and particularly uh, my own teacher, Professor Rakesh Chandra, who has taught me at my master's. And when I was completing my master's and uh, had idea to do my PhD, I had only one name, and that was Professor Rakesh Chandra. And uh, the, the kind of scholarship and intellectual aura that he possesses has really motivated me and uh, uh, kept me animated to do philosophy. So if I'm doing philosophy today, the, the source of encouragement has been Professor Chandra. So it is really uh, an honor and privilege uh, to speak in front of you when you are there as uh, uh, president of this uh, session. Uh, I'm also uh, thankful to this uh, learned audience who is present here. And the philosopher I have chosen to speak on is the most uh, quoted and well-read and the most controversial philosopher of this 20th century, and he is uh, Richard Rorty. So I have taken uh, this topic, which is from Kantian enlightenment to Rorty and Wright's a pragmatist perspective. So I have prepared my uh, uh, paper, and I'm going to largely read out this. And we'll have a more uh, engaging sessions when there will be questions, right? So this uh, uh, paper at uh, 
aims at examining what really constitutes the 18th century enlightenment project, how region, truth, and freedom are intertwined with each other and play the bedrock of Platonic and Kantian enlightenment. For the enlightenment, the region has been capable of unraveling the deeper human nature, which in turn frees us, the human beings, from their embeddedness to the concrete and contingent situations. The 18th century enlightenment project was to ensure human beings' confidence in themselves concerning matters of public importance. Its aim was to place the human beings' confidence in region in order to think for themselves and free them from the self-incurred immaturity. The emphasis of the Enlightenment project was to secure region a central place which is endowed with the capacity to fathom a universal human nature and thus guaranteeing freedom to human beings. The attempt will be made to understand whether the Kantian Enlightenment was uh, uh, Kantian Enlightenment has been able to achieve its proclaimed goal or it has failed. Many modern philosophers further see the advent of human rights from Kantian Enlightenment project as if human rights are just a part of the extended culture of the Enlightenment. Here I would like to bring in Richard Rorty who sees that the Enlightenment project has failed to achieve what it has prophesied. It could not overcome the platonic universal forms, something which have been transcendental in nature. For Rorty, the Enlightenment could not break away from the shadow of religion, which it had struggled against. Finally, the paper will attempt to examine whether the Enlightenment's goal can be achieved through invoking sentimentality rather than by knowing deeper human nature and universal moral principles. For him, human rights can best be viewed as nothing but the summarization from the given cultures and not from the given fixed human nature. So in my first part, I have dealt with uh, Kantian enlightenment. Let me begin by saying what we understand of enlightenment. It can be seen in the form of radical reform against the oppressive culture of religion dismissal of human region and freedom in the course of decision making for themselves. The scope of rational scrutiny or the criticality of region in human affairs is to delineate and decide upon the right and wrong, just and unjust, pious and impious. Putnam has drawn the similarity of Kantian enlightenment with Platonic enlightenment. Putnam traces the idea of transcendental reflection in Plato's dialogue between Euthyphro and Socrates regarding what is pious and what is impious. The discussion that ensues emphasizes whether something is good because it is God's will or God's will is good because it is in accordance with what is good. In Plato, the idea of good stands above all the seekers or reflective beings of good. The good had acquired the prestige of transcendental existence and so the idea of reason. And Putnam argues, and I quote, if we compare the 17th and 18th century enlightenment, the enlightenment with a capital E, with the earlier Platonic enlightenment, it is not hard to perceive both similarities and differences. On the side of the similarities, there is the same aspiration to reflective transcendence, the same willingness to criticize conventional beliefs and institutions and to propose radical reforms. The aspiration of reflective transcendence and the force to critique everything which is old and rotten is conspicuously seen the main task of Kantian enlightenment as well. Another salient feature of the enlightenment has been the growing of science with the claim of establishing objecting truths in the realm of physical world. The Copernican revolution has been the precursor of Kantian enlightenment and guided it through. Human region with freedom has become the central point of Kantian enlightenment. Kant writes, and I quote, enlightenment is human beings emergence from its self-incurred minority. Minority is the inability to use of one's own understanding without the direction from another. This minority is self-incurred when it, its cause lies not in lack of understanding, but in lack of resolution and courage to use it without direction from another, have courage to make use 
your own understanding is this motto of enlightenment for this enlightenment however nothing is required but freedom and indeed the least harmful of anything that could even be called freedom namely freedom to make public use of one's region in all matters and i end the quote here kantian enlightenment argues for absolute individual freedom for one to use his region in all matters this kantian project of enlightenment has had a tremendous effect on modern subject history culture language ethics and politics the positive spirit of enlightenment was to question the authority of the church and the divine rights of monarchs the questioning attitude of individuals to the highest authorities of their times has paved the way for modern liberalism however region turns to be foundational believing it as a historical a priori and necessary principle placing region beyond history culture language and tradition and granting it universal and necessary character is what has bothered pragmatists pragmatists have questioned universalism foundationalism essentialism and necessity in epistemology and in other areas of philosophy so in the next uh, section i am going to deal with region truth and freedom it is important to map the relationship between truth and region it is a platitude to say that truth is the property of a proposition proposition that becomes true or false in relation with the state of affairs region here supplies the justification part for any for any proposition being true or false now if region is universal and absolute it will provide transcendental justification and will establish universal and absolute truths in human and non human realms it is this sort of region that has been critiqued by pragmatists i would like to discuss roti here in order to understand a pragmatist critique of such metaphysical region and the epistemology that follows from it it is important to ask the question why for roti epistemology as a theory of knowledge lost its significance three giant philosophers wittgenstein heidegger and dewey have influenced roti to change the subject from traditional epistemology and metaphysics to alternative theory of knowledge and metaphysics in his book philosophy and the mirror of nature roti argues that pragmatists set aside epistemology and metaphysics as possible disciplines in consequences of pragmatism roti has aimed at under undermining the reader's confidence in the possibility of of a theory of knowledge that can establish the foundations of all knowledge claims and i uh, quote him so pragmatists see the platonic tradition as having outlived its usefulness this does not mean that they have non platonic set of answers to platonic questions to offer but rather that they do not think we should ask these questions anymore when they suggest that we not ask questions about the nature of truth and goodness they do not invoke a theory about the nature of reality or knowledge of man which says that there is no such thing as truth or goodness nor do they have a relativistic or subjectivist theory of truth or goodness they would simply like yeah. to change the subject roti's book yeah. contingency irony and solidarity epitomizes epistemology as outdated in a traditional sense for roti to say that we should drop the idea of truth as out there waiting to be discovered is not to say that we have discovered that out there there is no truth hence there is no universal human nature there are no universal truths about morality hence there is no universal human nature and there are no universal uh, truths about morality roti after abandoning reason and truth epistemology and metaphysics speaks about philosophy or human deliberation upon the issues dear to us goes in terms of ongoing conversation with mankind the notion of freedom occurs in relation to truth in roti's interview compilation uh, that is take care of freedom and truth will take care of itself edited by eduardo mendeta he in his introduction writes the power to reinscribe to redescribe to say something new and different something shocking and unexpected unscripted and unimposed is what roti is defending when he argues that if we take care of freedom truth will take care of itself take care of freedom means as we read in these interviews 
and in most of royalties public and occasional pieces giving priority to the political for the political is the horizon of solidarity and where our extended loyalties dwell the political understood in this way is dependent on the power of stories to transform it to keep it ever expanding and broadening and i end the quote here royalties emphasis here is on the functioning of political democracy where we all different groups and communities negotiate our interests and since we all are not the same uh, we we all are not on the same footing we need to have our enhanced sensibilities and expanding solidarities while exercising our freedom and if we take care of our freedom enough the discursive truth will sufficiently emerge itself though the truth here is not a transcendental or transcultural product or something that arises with a historical and a priori reason once and for all rather it is an expedient in the way of cooperating better with the world human and non human our sensibilities our solidarities can be expanded only through stories and narrations of pain and sufferings of others next i am going to deal with this topic rationality and animality the entire history of western philosophy beginning with plato descartes to kant they all maintain the metaphysical difference between rationality and animality rationality is something that is characteristic of human beings and animality is something that uniquely belongs to the animals with this rationality comes the possibility of knowledge the knowledge that only human beings can possess about everything else plato envisaged an absolute and universal region necessarily attached to humans that will enable us to discover the absolute idea of good for kant the same universal region has led to fathom the categorical moral imperatives this is strict schism between rationality and animality created by these philosophers has had enormous impact upon the history of ideas and human subject the history of philosophy under this duality has long prioritized region over feeling they they believe that with knowledge of universal moral truths the community life can be transformed into a moral community play to to kant all these philosophers have neglected the role of feeling or sentimentality as being subjective and something which can perpetuate prejudices and biases over objectivity and truth it is with hume that feeling has got some prestige in the philosophical and moral discourse he brought in feelings and gave it a central place in order to conceptualize the ethical discourse in the contemporary time it is rorty who sees hume as a precursor of pragmatist moral thinker and drew a lot from him to provide feeling a constitutive role in ethics for rorty pragmatism in is an attempt to break away from the image of human self as distinct from animals and align it with the darwinian image of self as continuous with animals darwinian image of uh, darwinian image of human self is not a distinct metaphysical entity rather continuous with animals the only difference human beings have from animal is that human beings manifest complex human behavior compared to animals pragmatists resist any form of essentialism as well as distinction of appearance and reality in intrinsic and extrinsic characteristics of things as educated by essentialists with the collapse of the distinction of appearance and reality rorty says the skeptic question of do we have the knowledge of things as they are becomes irrelevant so pragmatists replace the representational knowledge with whether our ways of describing the things help us to cope with reality better or help to help us to achieve our goals or fulfill our needs now i would like to discuss the distinction between morality and prudence since for pragmatists there are no non rational things and thus the distinction between morality and prudence becomes problematic one the concept of morality is understood as unconditional obligation a categorical imperative something which comes from our internal structure of human self whereas whereas prudence is a calculation on variegated things and interest to see good results 
pragmatists say that this distinction needs to be reinterpreted and reconstructed. Rorty writes about what Dewey says, and I quote, Dewey suggested that the reconstruct, that we reconstruct the distinction between prudence and morality in terms of the distinction between routine and non-routine social relationships. He saw prudence as a member of the same family of concepts as habit and custom. All three words describe familiar and relatively uncontroversial ways in which individuals and groups adjust to the stresses and strains of their non-human and human environments. It is obviously prudent both to keep an eye out for poisonous snakes in the grass and to trust strangers less than members of one's own family. Prudence, expediency, and efficiency are all terms which describe such routine and uncontroversial adjustment to the circumstance. Morality and law, on the other hand, begin with controversy when, when controversy arises. We invent both when we can no longer just do what comes naturally, when routine is no longer good enough, or when habit and custom no longer suffice and potential. The point emphasized by Rorty here is that the traditional distinction between morality and prudence is the same as the distinction between universal and particular, between region and passion, between objectivity and subjectivity, and so on. So region, morality, objectivity, and universality belong to the superior realm, and prudence, passion, particular facts, and subjectivity belong to the lower or inferior realm. Thus, this perceptual division has ruled over human and animal as two distinct entities. It is this division that has created the essentialism of human and animal existence. The Kantian moral categorical imperatives belong to the superior existence of uh, existence of humans and feelings and sentiment belong to the inferior existence of animals. Such understanding of morality is deeply mistaken and has led to a disaster in social and public life. By willful disregard and neglect of feelings have, prob have problematized and problematized the understanding about how human beings cope with other human beings and emerging situations. Morality is no different from prudence, and humans are no different from animals. They are continuous and belong to the same ontological category. Next, I'm going to uh, relate the entire discussion with the human rights. So human rights and sentimentality. From the above discussion, it can clearly be inferred that there is no universal region, there is no common human nature, and there is no a uh, set of universal moral principles. The idea of human rights has a strong bearing on the above discussion. The followers of the universalist project strongly believe that human rights have a foundation in our common human nature from which they have sprung. As Michael Freeman says, modern human rights theory began with John Locke's claim that we have certain natural rights because we have been made by God to last during his not our own pleasure. Locke's idea of natural rights come from his religious understanding that we are created by God and we last till he desires so. No one else has any right to interfere with his plan. Hence, natural rights are equally available to everyone. Since, increasingly, since in increasingly modern world, the concept of God comes under serious scrutiny. The idea of natural rights or human rights cannot be explained in terms of God. Therefore, the attempt to explain human rights foundationalism by grounding it in the idea of God from whom the human species came to existence has also short-lived its usefulness. Since pragmatists do not concede to the point that there is a deeper human self, human rights cannot be based on any such foundationalism. Such foundationalism and essentialism in human nature becomes repressive, annihilates human freedom. Santel Mufe and Ernesto Laclau says, the anthropological assumption of, human, of a human nature and of a unified subject, if we can determine a priori, the essence of a subject, every relation of subordination which denies it automatically becomes a relation of oppression. If the human essence is determined, a priori and once for all 
then the human region will go redundant since there will be nothing left over for region to think, envisage, and imagine in terms of life projects and goals. Moreover, the historical experiences have glaringly shown us that human essentialism has been counterproductive in human progress and has allowed suppression of the people on a large scale. Laclau further says, to reformulate the values of the Enlightenment in the direction of a radical historicism and to renounce is, is rationalistic, epistemological, and ontological foundations, then is to expand the democratic potentialities of that tradition, while abandoning the totalitarian tendencies arising from its reoccupation of the ground of apocalyptic universalism. Echoing with pragmatists, Laclau also concurs to the point that the self-image is historically constructed. It is not given a priori. If it is given a priori, the only way would have been left to us is to historically realize it. In such a scenario, the collective human endeavor and democratic processes to envision the future, future would cease. Therefore, Laclau argues, in favor of those values of enlightenment, which will place radical historicism in a center of center for of center for democracy to get strengthened and against those values of enlightenment like rationalism and foundationalism, which will embolden the totalitarian tendencies. As Michael Freeman says, that for both Rorty and Laclau, there are no foundations of human rights, rather, they sprang from the contingent historical experiences with an aim to make the society better and livable. Though Rorty says the, that universalist and rationalist philosophers like Plato and Kant believe in the transcendental faculty of reason, which can know the transcendental truth. The Platonic idea that we have true self and the Kantian idea that being rational is to be moral, both are problematic, as Beer has argued. Here, I would like to discuss an instance of human rights violation as quoted by Rorty in his Truth and Progress. And I quote, a Muslim man in Bosansi Petrov was forced to bite off the penis of a fellow Muslim. If you say that a man is not human, but the man looks like you, and the only way to identify this devil is to make him drop his trousers. Muslim men are circumcised and Serb men are not. It is probably only a short step psychologically to cutting off his prick. There has never been a campaign of ethnic cleansing from which sexual sadism has gone missing. And the quote ends here. In this case of dehumanization of a Muslim man, Rorty says, is not a torture of a human, rather non-human, or so-called different from us human beings. The question here arises is that it is not the case that Serbians do not know what it is to be human. But the issue is that they do not believe Muslims to be like them or at par with human beings. Rorty argues that the conception that human beings have universal self or true self and the knowledge of their true nature will not prevent the occurrences of both dehumanization and human tortures. Now we have to change our question from what is our true nature to what can we become? Pragmatists have dropped the interest in knowing what is the true nature of human beings. There is something seriously wrong with the traditional belief that human beings have true self, since even knowing it does not pre preclude us from violating the human rights of others. Rorty has developed anti-foundationalism about human rights from the Argentinian jurist and philosopher Eduardo Rabossi. And he writes, and I quote, on Rebos's view, philosophers like Alan Gewert are wrong to argue that human rights cannot depend upon historical facts. My basic point, Rebossi says, is that the world has changed, that the human rights phenomenon renders human rights foundationalism outmoded and irrelevant. I shall enlarge upon and defend Rebossi's claim that the question of whether human beings really have the rights enumerated in the Helsinki Declaration is not wrong, is not worth raising. In particular, I shall defend the claim that nothing relevant to moral choice separates human beings from animals, except historically contingent facts of the world 
cultural facts. And I end the quote here. So Rorty argues that we do not uh, that we do uh, do not need to assume any transcendental transcultural entity to ground the emergence of human rights. There is nothing transcendental which can explain the rise and validity of human rights except more cultural facts. Human rights can be best viewed as cultural products emanating from our historical experiences. There is nothing essential in human rights so as to why one should accept them. But their significance lies in their best capacity of fulfilling the demand of our time. Now the fulfillment of the Kantian Enlightenment project, or as Rorty puts it, Enlightenment's cosmopolitan utopias can be achieved not by recognizing universal morality among human beings, but by invoking the requirement of feeling or sentimentality. When pragmatists say there is no foundation of human rights, they are not rejecting their importance and pressing demand of the human rights culture, but their birth, but their birth lies in the historical contingency. For Rorty, our moral response towards the other is not due to recognizing some law-like principle or morality as propounded by Kant, but by immediate recognition of the pain and sufferings of the other. Drawing upon Bayer and Hume, Rorty writes, and I quote here, Bayer describes Hume as the woman's moral philosopher, because Hume held that corrected sympathy, not law discerning reason, is the fundamental moral capacity. This substitution would mean thinking of the spread of human rights culture not as a matter of becoming more aware of the requirements of the moral law, but rather as what Bayer calls a progress of sentiments. This progress consists in increasing ability to see the similarities between ourselves and people very unlike us as outweighing the differences. It is the result of what I have been calling sentimental education. And I end the quote here. Finally, I would like to conclude by arguing that Rorty's take on morality and human rights culture is rightly placed in the glaring failure of Platonic and Kantian metaphysics of universal self and morality. The progress of morality and human rights is better achieved by invoking sentimental education. The manipulation of feelings and feelings and sentiments are more important to use human to to see human beings increasingly becoming moral and observing human rights and making this world ever peaceful thank you for your patient listening thank you so much dr rahul it was a very brainstorming session i would say and now the session is open for discussion. You may ask uh, your question directly to the speaker if you have any. Yeah, please. So please, Uh, I want a little bit of clarification. Uh, while mentioning Rawls, uh, you said that he justified idea of right grounding in and the conception of God. I think it is not a correct understanding. Uh, Rawls imagines a hypothetical. Uh, you also, uh, I think, uh, I heard Rawls also. Okay, uh, anyways, uh, the conclusion of uh, Rorthian enterprise is cultural relativism. Okay, with regard to morality, if we grant cultural relativism that we cannot criticize the immoral practices of other cultures, for instance, uh, racism. So, racism is wrong whether it is a historical phenomenon confined to a uh, united state similarly we cannot uh, condemn untouchability or caste practices uh, because we can defend it by saying this is peculiar to our culture 
and therefore no universal transhistorical standard can be applied to criticize this. So my submission is that we need a certain transhistorical, uh, transcultural perspective in order to criticize violation of human rights and morality. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir, for your really uh, important question. And I was expecting such questions must come up. Uh, I think it is the other way around, right? Uh, the way this metaphysics has actually ruled the entire philosophy, right? Where we believe it is uh, universalism or essentialism, right? Uh, since you have referred the caste practice, I think it has got reified and perpetuated only because we have been taught that things have been rationally thought they are permanent they are fixed so you cannot change it right and what roti is saying there might be a wrong practices occurring in the name of what uh, uh, historical contingency is talking about but whatever sort of principle or a policy you arrive at you arrive at with the sense of humility that you might be wrong and that's why in each and every juncture of the history, whatever you uh, devise as a tool to govern the society can be challenged and can be uh, uh, changed. So I think this is what he's also concerned, how we can actually uh, do away with the historical uh, torturings and sufferings, right? He has already said, you see, historically, we, I mean, the, from the traditional philosophy, we have come to believe what is uh, the true human nature. And he has given the example of Muslims and the Serbian people, right? So it is understood what really constitutes of being human. And yet, when it comes to other human beings, there are certain certain pity differences upon that. We go on excluding peoples which are which do not look like us. So I think it is a sort of a contingency, the historical experiences through which we have arrived at certain junctions junctures right and if they have been wrong they can always be corrected but in a, a sort of uh, absolute universal metaphysics right you you are not allowed to change it because it has come heavily upon you as fix and that's why not only that even the uh, people who have been historically suppressed and violated into their minds this universality have been in imprinted and that's why they cannot muster a courage to resist against it so i think this very idea of contingency everything that we believe is uh, needed for us in our time this is what i would like to answer may i say something may i say something hello uh, yeah, sure, ma'am. Okay. Uh, Rahul, it is... Uh... Hello? Uh, yeah. Yeah, ma'am. Now you may uh, speak. Oh. Is your volume okay. Rahul, this is... Uh, 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 thank you for your, uh, for, for your presentation, but I would love to see uh, that the whole conceptualization of of, of this universal humanism uh, uh, sorry let me introduce myself I, i'm a, a culture studies uh, professor in jain university and i was the uh, uh, state member of women's commission karnataka uh, i'm meera chatavarti so rahul this is a, 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 we have to also ask the uh, attack the foundational uh, uh, the uh, platform where uh, the whole whole uh, uh, idea of the progressive narrative of, of uh, universal humanism uh, is uh, has been spread as by whom by the by the capitalist uh, mode of production not only that but, uh, through conquest and colonization so when the, when when con colonization and conquest have been have been the uh, modes to spread universal humanism, you can see the contradiction. So I think you should uh, attack this foundation itself 
because otherwise what happens is the term human is not including you it includes so many humans it includes it, it excludes women it is excludes lgbt uh, q it excludes black it excludes the uh, dalits it, it, it in, in what way the term human itself is is uh, uh, is uh, kind of proper so therefore uh, not only the term human uh, has to has to be even even rotty i think the the enlightenment uh, uh, dialogues or enlightenment thinkers uh, must be uh, they have just couched this uh, progressive idea progressive narrative through this missing that the uh, the world has been taken or the or the human world has been taken by conquest and colonization thank you so much uh, thank you so much sir uh, uh, thank you so much ma'am for your uh, right observation i think you are absolutely right when you're saying that when the west has act west capitalism has conquered the world right now in that uh, conquering of uh, of this entire world by the west if this universalism or essentialism uh, has been taken seriously then uh, many of us are left uh, outside from uh, from their own construction so uh, and not only this the entire uh, division of what it is to be human right has been taken on many uh, aspects and uh, not only uh, uh, women even men have been also excluded now the women have been considered as if they they lifelong lifelong remain childlike because they do not possess that rationality now, similarly the blacks do not possess the rationality and that's why they are not uh, considered to be at par with human beings so if we really stick to this universalist project then it is actually a further enslaving rather than actually liberating so the contingency has invoked the sense of humility that we are a limited human beings we have a limited capacity and we cannot go into future to see how the world is going to be ultimately look like so uh, it is always progress with this sense of contingency and humility and the historical experiences are the guiding forces through which we can summarize certain principles but it is not the certain principles are there into existence just because they have emanated from certain truths right so this is what i would like to say may i ask something hello may i ask something uh, yes sir please ask your question Okay. Thank you, Priyanka. Uh, I'm Professor R K Jha. I should have been there. I apologize for that. Due to some personal reasons, I could not be there in the offline mode. But I am here on the online mode, and I have listened to the lecture carefully. And first of all, I would like to congratulate Rahul for his wonderful paper and lecture. And uh, there are a few things which are still going on in my mind, and I would like to have some clarification from Rahul regarding that. uh you see when we are talking of uh, human rights the question definitely arises as was pointed out by the person by ma'am in the last question what do we mean by humans because uh, on the one hand in your lecture you have yourself uh, taken the position that uh, according to the darwinian principle there is no categorical difference between animals and humans except that you know the humans have the Uh, capacity for a more complex behavior mentally and physically but uh, that is only a matter of uh, quantitative difference not qualitative difference i would say so uh, first of all the question arises is the very concept of human rights uh, required do we really need a separate concept of human rights in contrast with uh, the concept of the rights for all living beings because if the living beings are a continuum in which human beings constitute a small part then perhaps it would be more uh, appreciative if we could think of the entire realm of human beings and uh, think what should be the way of uh, behaving between the different beings uh, and what should be considered appropriate or inappropriate of course in a relative sense so that is one thing i would like to you know have your comment on 
the second point uh, was something related with uh, the conclusion that you have given and uh, where you have said that uh, ultimately you have to give more uh, importance to feelings for understanding the concept of human rights in contrast with some given universal narrative or the principle of uh, rationality something so uh, then you know it's like shifting the goal post because uh, you are uh, moving from rationality or you are moving from the concept of what is the divine to the concept of the feeling but that does not really solve the problem because uh, you know when you are talking of feeling it's a very subjective thing and uh, this not not even there is no stability in the nature of feeling even for a given subject it may change from time to time with respect to the same given situation or object and moreover for the different uh, subjects uh, it may vary in nature and intensity uh, in the context of a given uh, common situation so uh, the question arises uh, how do we uh, how do we understand the nature of feeling and how do we use it as a criterion for deciding about what is to be considered human right and what should not be considered a human right because you need a separate criterion that may be applicable to the feelings themselves and uh, you know you have if feelings is is a is, is an omnibus term you have a uh, good feelings bad feelings uh, loving feelings hateful feelings all of them are feelings so just using the term feelings without any qualification it does not really help much so we need uh, a, a way of understanding and uh, you know demarcating the nature of feelings and uh, which feelings should be used for understanding human rights or the rights of all living beings in general and that requires a separate set of uh, values altogether and where do we get that from the question arises so i would like to you know hear the views of rahul on these things thank you thank you sir for your really important and uh, brilliant questions uh, let me begin from your second question where you have uh, mentioned that uh, this sentimentality part or the feeling is problematic because it becomes subjective and i think uh, roti has already taken uh, this part and clarified he is saying that uh, when we talk about moral principles in a kantian framework right that there are uh, absolute and universal moral uh, categorical imperatives arrived at through rational capacity they are very abstract and they are not going to help you in a real situations right so when you are faced with certain real situations suppose when it comes to uh, come to the help to your own child or remove the suffering of your own loved ones you never recall any moral principles right it comes naturally you act to save your child or your loved ones from the suffering and torture when it comes to the distant people whom you have never encountered then you have to think about no no since there are rational moral principles and we have to equally treat them and that's why you have to ethically act but then it never ever motivates you then the people becomes number and when we see casualties or any uh, 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 disasters happen people have been killed but we simply go on turning the pages when you read the newspaper you don't get the similar kinds of feeling so this rationality is there at one place but what he is saying that rationality has not been sufficient to make us moral enough to make us live a livable or peaceful life and that's why though you can, you may call it uh, certain kinds of sentimentality as prejudice or subjective but the feeling of love care and respect is something that we need to nurture or inculcate among the human beings and for that we need to introduce certain education which can actually manipulate and transforms our feelings that is how even you see the kind of political uh, propaganda goes on they are also working on sentimentalities but they are working on our negative sentimentalities so i think and that is how they are transforming the human beings into automata we also need to create another sort of uh, feeling sentiments and that is positive in a sense the feelings for feeling of love care and respect and that is how we can really become true moral human beings or moral agents and to your first question where you're seeing that saying that this 
uh, since Rorty is not making any ontological difference between four-footed animals and the bipeds, he is only making this distinction in terms of varying capacities. Like the bipeds are expressing more complex uh, capacities, they possess a sort of uh, uh, linguistic tools to make certain uh, rules, laws, and uh, policies. I think uh, the feeling, I mean, the idea of suffering, right, or pain is something that can guide us and make us unite what we call human beings. And it does not stop you to go at the level of four footed animals, also. Many people have already started arguing for animal rights. So it is. it only depends on our increased sensibilities, whether you consider only bipeds as human beings or you also consider the four-footed animals who are also expressing the similar uh, uh, capacity of uh, undergoing pain and suffering. So it never stops you. I think I have uh, tried to answer your question, sir. OK, thank you. Thank you for your response. Yeah. Now, Abhinav, you may ask your question. Thank you so much, ma'am. And thank you, sir, for such an enlightening lecture. After so long time, I mean, we have been bestowed with such an enlightening lecture. And I'm very much grateful to that. It's my question. Uh, my question regards to the moral values, particularly the universal will and universe, universal values as the chief exponent of universal will, Plato, and other one is Immanuel Kant. Both have been chief exponent of universal will. They have channelized the human, I mean, sentiments in certain way that could be manifested in every human being. I mean, people must acknowledge the sort of symmetrical structure amongst all human beings. On that basis, the human rights could be established. And but my question regarding here, uh, regarding Rorty, Richard Rorty, because seemingly he has been under the shade of moral relativism, particularly the the culture of postmodernism. I, I, I must say this cult because it, there has a lot been calamities and atrocities have happened in the name of more moral relativism and, and postmodernism, particularly if I would say that. And the Harris point is that if he talks about human rights and he denies at the same time transcultural values, transhistorical values, and sometimes trans transcendental values and universal will, then how could he restore the human sentiments while talking and advocating for the human rights? That seems to me a little bit contradictory. And uh, most importantly, because Chomsky has very much uh, recognized this sort of universal symmetry in human consciousness by taking the recourse to the, to the ling linguistics, I mean, universal grammar, then on that basis, Chomsky denied the moral relativism, particularly there was a debate between Michel Foucault and Chomsky had happened uh, by a Portuguese TV. So I must say that, could you please, uh, I mean, give your insight on the Richard Rorty's remark, particularly in response to the Chomsky's moral relativism. And here is one thing, one comment I must say, Professor Bagade has very rightly pointed out that we need trans-historical and trans-cultural human entity in order to establish the human rights. Then I must ask Professor, then what would be the what would be the entity if we completely weed out the historical and cultural values in human beings? Because whatsoever human beings, human beings are culturally driven and and historically entailed human beings. If we completely as completely eliminate these sort of values, then would be completely boneless or some sort of fleshless skeleton. Because as John Paul Sartre, the French philosopher, very rightly demonstrated that that uh, I mean, we are nothing but a patchwork of society, patchwork, I mean, sort of chakati jo kapde pe aap lagate ho, some sort of patchwork of society. Because whatsoever we are, we are completely driven by our cultural values and historical values. I think we don't need trans historical and cultural human being. We need trans evaluation of those cultural and historical values. Thank you, sir. Thank you, for, your, thank you for your question. I think. Uh, this question of moral relativism is uh, has been haunting Richard Rorty, and he's been uh, trying to repeatedly clarify uh, the sort of uh, contingency he is talking about does not lead to the sort of uh, uh, epistemic or moral relativism. Why he is saying this? He is saying that the idea of the rec the immediate recognition of pain and sufferings of others is actually leading or motivating us to gradually reform and develop your 
vocabularies, right? The sort of practices or vocabularies that you have arrive at certain moment of time, right? If they are not addressing, right, the larger or the entire uh, so-called uh, a group of people, right, or the entire community, then you need to change your uh, your uh, vocabulary, right, or your uh, moral intuitions, right. So he has given this idea of ethnocentrism, right, where he's saying that we need to gradually become one ethnic community. We need to broaden the horizons of ourselves where nobody is left out. Everybody is taken part of that. And what can guide us to make everyone uh, becoming the member of yourself, right, where you are overlooking the petty differences. But the idea of immediate recognition of pain and suffering can help us to consider each and every one uh, a part of your own self. And that is how a sort of vocabulary that we are gradually changing and uh, going towards as if the final vocabulary is this, uh, the suffering and pain of the others can be one guiding force, right? So uh, this is uh, to your one question. And I think you, uh, this is what I have, I have answered. Uh, to the question of moral relativism. So he is not actually ending up in a sort of moral relativism where we can claim that anything goes, right? So it is not that Rorty is so foolish and saying that anything goes, right? Then it will become self-refuting, right? Self-contradictory. He is merely saying that the any sort of vocabularies or any sort of self that you possess at a moment of time it is nothing but emanating from your historical experiences. And as long as it is serving your purpose, you keep it. As long as it does not serve your purposes, you change it, you reform it, and you develop completely new vocabularies. So that's why he's saying the conversation of mankind will go on. There is no any transcultural, transhistorical truth that will determine how you should actually govern yourself or how uh, happiness to be achieved, right? how to live a peaceful life. There is no such transcultural truth. There is no such deeper human nature that you can really, really dive and find them, right? Rather, it is the ongoing conversation, right? And whenever you are developing something, right, it is a sort of conversation, right? If the dominant people, the powerful people have imposed some, something, right, the downtrodden people can resort to sort of protest through which the conversation can be resorted, can be established. And then you develop certain new vocabulary. So this process of development of reform is continuously going on, right? Rajan, are you there? Uh, Uh, there is one question by Jayanti P. Sahu. Uh, she is asking, uh, what do you mean by being human? What do you mean by being human? Uh, would you like to answer this question? I think this is what Rot is saying. Let us stop asking this question. What is it to be human? Let's ask what sort of beings we can become, right? What sort of people you want to become? Let's ask this question. And then accordingly, we can develop our principles or vocabularies to govern our life. Right? We can become cruel. We can become good people. Rather than really looking for what sort of human beings we are born with, or is there any grand or divine purpose for which we are born, we can ask, we can change this simple question and ask what sort of beings we can become. Right? So there, I think the idea of human being will lies. I think I have answered your question, ma'am. Uh, Sivain Vikram Singh, are you there? If you're there, you may ask your question directly. Yes. Yeah. Y yes, ma'am. Uh, am I audible? Yeah, you are audible. Okay. Uh, namaste uh, to sir and the whole panel and the platform itself. It was a fantastic lecture. Uh, just please allow me a minute to state my concern and my question. I feel this is important and I'm really scared today. Uh, there are around 40 students in this lecture, some online, some offline, and many would have further online commitments after this. And mind you, this is the biggest philosophy department in our country. 
this is one fact second uh, a recent survey in vardha showed that online has given us very powerful tools powerpoint etc but still most teachers use reading you know to deliver uh, classrooms now when education is a tag on cv where we learn to say that i don't like to do it rather than accept that i don't know how to do it where is education the bedrock of all ethics in this one and two what we as academics can do to restore the joy of learning that not everything is uh, you know a tag on the cv and uh, you know with in in such a crazy scenario where we you know for future learners we where we have challenges like you know short attention span and our mental faculties like attention they are the biggest products for sale for facebook for you know fp feed and these are the things where, where do you think education is in all this where do you think uh, ethics come into all this thank you sir uh, i don't think this question is directly related to my talk but i can still attempt uh answering it uh i think your whole focus is that why people are not using uh, the powerpoint presentation in the modern time because it no has... sir no sir no sir please 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 it's 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 not about that it's not about a particular it's about a universal thing please i have stated many other things sir so please don't make it personal i am saying that where is education no, no, I'm, that I'm, everything I'm to in, it in this only if yeah, you allow yes. me uh i'm just saying that the the extreme use of uh, technological gadgets right uh the survey from the west has come that the excessive use of powerpoint presentation is boring to the students right they lose their focus and concentration so when you are speaking to the students right uh seeking their attention that is where they learn most rather than simply pointing out the things which are there uh, displayed on the digital board so uh, Uh, i think i would still prefer the traditional way of speaking and engaging the students i'm not completely uh, uh, avoiding that people should not use there are certain things which you want to display and for that you need to have that uh, uh, display i mean this digital board and electronic electronic I, but i think so you're missing the bigger question and that is that how to restore the joy of learning where education is a tag on cv that is the bigger question i think uh, uh certain questions which if they are not directly linked to my talk they can be addressed by a uh, uh, chairperson i think who is, is also there yeah thank you um rajan are you there <laughs> see there is one question before i take this question um uh, jayanti p sahu ma'am she has asked that what alternative model you have <laughs> would you like to take <laughs> ma'am i think i have not proposed any alternative uh solution right i'm just theoretically deliberating how the society should actually move how we should actually reflect back on what is given to us and what sort of a society we want to make what would be actually the procedural uh, way of determining certain things so there i think uh, uh, in a pragmatist spirit in a rotian sense i have criticized a sort of uh, fundamental i mean foundationalism and universalism and essentialism this is what uh, i would like to uh, say thank you okay i think uh, then can i can i uh, hello rahul can yeah. i uh, yes, can i ask hello yeah ma'am go ahead uh, can i ask uh, uh, answer mr shivendra vikram singh yes you you can you can ma'am yeah okay what what one fundamental uh, uh, position is that yes uh, students do have very short uh, 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 concentration 
but uh, it's also contradictory that they are uh, they have total concentration if there is a rap going on or or, uh, or 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 some fun programs are going on so this con concentration is always with you 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 have taken the priority to uh, you know to scatter it to uh, something which you think as fun now your second question is serious i, I do understand uh, what we can also do is uh, is that suppose we give the con 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 content of the uh, lecture distribute it uh, uh, among all the students ask them to read it and come back and have a participatory discussion because if it is one way talk it might bore you but if it is a participatory discussion then it can be uh, you can you can also gauge it doesn't mean that sitting on the other side of the uh, table makes me omniscient no but it will also be uh, many times it, it also helps from the, the, the students feedback is quite important so i think you can have a participatory discussion instead of having this thank you rahul and thank you ma'am uh, organizer thank you professor rakesh Chief. okay ma'am thank you for answering his questions now uh, i think rajan has asked uh, some question let me uh, try to respond i think uh, you asking uh, putting this question the same question which even roti has been dealing with that this sort of relativism uh, is going to uh, put us into a self refuting situation and i think roti has uh, very clearly answered that he is not putting forth an idea of relativism right it is not a sort of subjectivism that he's uh, talking about where anything and everything goes on right so there are certain sort of constraints in terms of uh, the purpose that you decide for the society and then you can uh, develop and devise a certain vocabulary or principle which can actually help rather this as i have also discussed and focus in my discussion that this universalism and essentialism has been repressive for masses so uh, that we need to take seriously thank you Okay. Uh, now I think let's have uh, the pleasure of listening to the presidential remark of the Honorable Chairperson. Uh, I request uh, Professor Chandra. Uh, is there? Sir, thank I'm you very much. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. It has been. Uh, I must thank uh, the organizers, uh, my very dear friend uh, Professor Anand Mishra, and uh, all the uh, uh, faculty members of. The, the Banaras Hindu University, who uh, are very dear to me for inviting me uh, to listen to uh, Rahul on an extremely engaging issue of human rights and uh, the whole discussion uh, in terms of philosophical development from early times to enlightenment and uh, Roti's own take on that. Uh, it is an, an extremely difficult area for many reasons. And one of the reasons why I wish to draw the attention of all the members of the philosophical community here is that we need to distinguish the distinctions of our inquiry. A human right inquiry in terms of the psychology of human rights a human right inquiry into the history of human rights, a human right inquiry into the sociology of human rights and the human economy of human rights and the human right discussion in philosophy need to be very carefully distinguished. And I think uh, as we do a conceptual inquiry into the nature of human rights, the repeated question will come on the kind of question that Jayanti is asking, the kind of question that everybody is asking, is it, okay, what does it mean to be human? What does it mean to have rights? And as we know, the whole rights discourse has a history and it also has a certain kind of a conceptual inquiry. In terms of rights, we sometimes talk about right and wrong, right and left, and rights and duties. Mainly we talk about rights and duties and rights and 
obligations, uh, right and wrong, in terms of normative inquiry. Now, this normative inquiry, where we talk about that, again, has two different tastes. Being right is something that we, it's an adverbial use of the language, that something is right. And having a right is actually more or less in the dative case, where you say, it's an entitlement that I have. Now, why do I have it then, at that entitlement? And when I have an entitlement, then somebody needs to have a corresponding duty. So if I have a right as a child, as a Dalit, as a woman, as a man, as an Indian, as a citizen, or as a holder of an insurance policy, then somebody, an individual, an institution, or a framework needs to be obliged to ensure, protect, and promote that right. We know the discussion of rights has a long history. And in recent time, everybody who talks about rights talks about Dworkin taking rights seriously and taking rights as trumps and so on and so forth. So one is to understand that the human right discourse is entrenched in the discussion where you are talking about within a social context of institutions, there are people and these people are entrusted or entitled to certain things certain services and certain kinds of attitudes, mainly in human rights, the attitude of respect. So food, clothing, shelter, and being respected for being human, not because of your power, prestige, and wealth, but just being human entitles you to a certain kind of respect. We also remember Marx saying that not only human beings have needs, they have a special human way of satisfying those needs. So when a dog is hungry or a cat is hungry and a man is hungry, sometimes you can throw food at the dog and the dog's hunger would be satisfied. But the man would feel that his hunger has to be satisfied not only in terms of be, uh, his hunger being satisfied, but being satisfied in a dignified human way. And this is again the kind of spirit which we draw from the writings of people like Immanuel Kant that people, human beings, not only have a price, they have value. And this, again, has a long history in all traditions, including the philosophical traditions of the so-called East and West. Within that, the further question is about what is the source of human right? And the sources were, as we, it's well known, that is it the divine denotation? And curiously, very curiously, uh, the American Constitution also talks about all human beings be, being equal because God made them to be so. And sometimes a lot of discussion coming that human beings are equal because God made them to be so. And we know the obvious difficulties with that. Supposing I do not believe in God or my God himself created, in fact, not one, but three kinds of people who deserve three kinds of treatments or 10 types of people who deserve 10 types of treatment. Or I do not believe in that. Now, so the, therefore, basing the human rights on uh, divinity is not something which has been accepted ever. Similarly, uh, the idea that it comes from a social contract, again, is an idea which has actually a huge amount of difficulties with all social contract theory, that who went into a contract? When did this contract happen? So we know that the contractarians are also not giving you a historical account, but in fact, giving you a kind of an analytical device to understand that actually these have a foundation in what now uh, uh, Rahul is also mentioning and what Rotti is mentioning is it's based upon a certain kind of a consensus of people, as it were. So people got together, as it were, and in order to protect themselves from each other, because we are brutish, selfish, and cruel, we went into a contract and said that, no, let's not rob each other and let's not kill each other while the other is asleep. Now, this kind of a theory also has its huge limitations. The third kind of thing which has come is in terms of the sources of human rights has been what has been generally called crudely the constructivist theory. That a human being is actually not a description, but a program. We are human beings is not a description of what we are, but what we aspire to be. It is like more or less what we did with the Indian constitution, when we said we are a sovereign socialist democratic republic, we were not describing ourselves, but giving ourselves an agenda. This is what we want to become. So when we say 
that we are human beings, then we are saying that we want to become human beings and then treat human beings humanly and then they will become humans. So treat somebody with dignity and that person will become dignified by virtue of being treated so. It's not that it comes from some other source of an essential nature which is given in nature factually or given by God as it were. Now this is also a theory which has I think Jack Nonley and so many people have been talking about it for the past 30-40 years and a huge amount of discussion has gone into this. Now philosophical discussion uh, of human rights has to be entrenched within the larger discourse of ethics and the Now also, I think for the past 30-40 years, a lot of people are saying there is no connection between ethics and metaphysics. And they are saying that you can have any kind of metaphysics, but a certain kind of an ethical behavior can go. Uh, I want to call your attention to this fact. And this is in fact, an ethics without metaphysics is something that people are talking about. I have a humble submission that what we can gather is only that there's a contingent relationship between metaphysics and certain ethical theories. You can have, just like in epistemology, you can be a rationalist and an idealist, a rationalist and a realist. Similarly, you can be an empiricist and a realist and an empiricist and an idealist. So also in moral theory, you may have a certain kind of a moral theory, which is consonant both with a, a absolutism and the same moral theory may not be consonant with uh, absolutism, but with relativism. But can you have, can you have an ethical theory which has actually no idea of a human being, no idea of a society, no idea of a maybe human flourishing and no idea uh, in terms of which uh, people have to work together. And I think that doesn't make sense. This metaphysics may not be absolute. This metaphysics may not be the metaphysics of idealists, but the rejection of idealism is an old hat. Idealism was rejected by Aristotle. Its new face was reject rejected by the champions of analytical philosophy. So all Moore, Russell, etc., 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 had also, all of them had rejected that. Now, I want to ask uh, and draw your attention to a, uh, to a few other distinctions. The distinction between absolute and relative, universal and particular, objective and subjective, and also the big distinction between reason and emotion. The much maligned uh, modernists, the much maligned enlightenment, and about which, it, in fact, Meera Chakravarti was also saying, oh, the Western hegemony and Western enlightenment and the others. Let us really look at the whole history as well as also, if not good to history, let us look at the concept itself. Now, what is the kind of a concept that you are coming with? The concept of human being in the human rights is actually an autonomous moral self minimal autonomous moral self. The theory which is being used in most of the human rights discourse is a very minimal kind of thing, act according to a principle which you can build to be universal law, a categorical imperative as it were, which accepts the equality and equal dignity of all human beings. If you go further back, you go back to Aristotle who talks about political competence. All human beings have a political competence. And what is this political competence? to be able to understand the other person's conception of good. Now, this cap capacity of human being to uh, relate to other people empathetically, to understand actually takes away or undercuts the whole argument of solipsistic consciousness. And Aristotle very nicely says, man is an ethical being, man is a linguistic being, both ethics and 
language require sociality. So isolated, solipsistic consciousness of man is undercut in the very first phase. So there can be a person who's thinking only about himself or a person who's using language only for himself is undercut even way back, much before Uncle Wittgenstein started thinking in Aristotle himself. Now, this kind of an understanding that human beings are essentially social, human beings are essentially intersubjective, human consciousness is essentially intersubjective, is at the root of the idea of human being, which is coming in the time of enlightenment as a minimal kind of a clause. Now, the human right discourse in most of the world, in philosophy and outside the world, is taking theories of Amartya Sen and theories of Martha Nussbaum and theories of Sabina el Kere very seriously. These are theories which draw upon the idea of human beings as actually, human being is actually a bundle of capabilities. And we are looking at all human development in terms of as whether a society is good or bad, how much space does it give for the development of human capabilities? A good society is the one which gives you maximal space for the development of human capabilities. And what are these human capabilities? To have a long, painless life, to have, not, to have bodily integrity, to be able to form your own idea of practical reason in terms of what is good or not good for you, to be able to have affiliation with nature, to be able to form bonds on your own, to be able to control both natural and political resources. And these are the kind of 10 capabilities that Martha is talking about, which Sen is not talking about. I know that there are these very uh, popular things, Tina Chanter, and we all know a huge uh, uh, number of people who are saying that, no, 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 no. This is a cultural relativist idea. The idea of human uh, autonomy is also a Western idea. And we in India and many other places uh, are living in, in French societies and the others. Please look at it more carefully. And when you look at each capability as is given in the capability theory and each right that it is given in the human right charter, tell me which of the rights is a right which is actually a Western hegemonic right. That the human right discourse has been used by big countries and individuals to uh, oppress people, to humiliate people, is an extra systemic kind of a question. And philosophers may be usefully engaged in that, but not essentially engaged in that. The very nature and the concept of the human rights, which bases itself on the idea of human dignity, equality of human beings, non-hierarchicality of all human rights, inalienability of human rights, even in the case of a criminal, who uh, we were talking about Kasab's right to a biryani till the last day that he was eating, are rights which are entrenched within this framework. And therefore, I think the sociological, historical, empirical hypocrisy of individuals and cultures of using the human right thing to oppress nations and people is a separate question altogether from the philosophical question about understanding the nature of human rights. And that is where I think Richard Rorty also needs to uh, examine himself a little more seriously. Is he, in his reading of Plato, being right? I have been looking at, when he said that, no, no, uh, the earlier search for the mirroring image must be replaced by conversationality. Conversationality is actually a procedure. What shall be the conversation? What, well, what will the conversation will be about? Is, will it be about my Fab India jacket and where was it manufactured and the women who made it for 20 rupees finally get uh, sold for 2000 rupees and the profit goes to certain other things is a different story. Now, is this story going to decide morality? And when will that story convert into a story of morality? will this be decided not by the process of conversation, but by the content of the conversation, what constitutes morality. The constitutive elements of democracy and the procedural effect elements of democracy have to be carefully distinguished. 
the constitutive elements of democracy are equal respect for all the member participants. The procedural effects would be that dialogue and discussion needs to be there, that information has to be shared, that information has to be properly processed, and there have to be rational procedures so that they are corrected. Now, all these questions are all important questions in which philosophers can engage. But the famous phrase of Richard Rorty, take care of that truth will take care of itself, take care of democracy, freedom, and truth will take care of itself, is actually a bad philosophy. Freedom, why should we take care of freedom, if I may ask? It depends, about, it is because I believe that human beings are essentially free. That human, uh, the nature of human being consists in his freedom. Now, this essentiality is itself accepted, foundational, and universal. If you do not accept that, freedom is of no value. Why is freedom valuable? If you ask, say for instance, in uh, Plato, the question is, knowledge, an unexamined life is not worth living. Why? There is a close relationship between truth, function of a human being, function of a society, and the kind of vision that we have for future. Rorty is repeating it, calling our attention to, no, no, historically it has taken care of. Historically, we came to know that man descended from the apes. But this is not a truth created by history. This is a truth which is actually the truth, as it were, in an objective, objective way. So historicism, which Rorty is talking about, he wants to distinguish his historicism from historical determinism. And he's a historicist that he says that actually date and times matter. And he's against historical determinism that actually historical forces completely determine the cases. And that I think Rahul uh, needs to tell everybody more clearly in his papers. That this is not just a declaration that I am not a relativist. He's, he's trying to very clearly distinguish himself from the cultural relativism of Marxian theory. Because the Marxian theory is actually explaining away everything as a cultural byproduct. Roti is saying, I am not a historical determinist. I am actually saying that history positions us, yet there is a possibility of creation. Now, this kind of a position which Roti is taking is very important and needs to be seen very carefully. I am still wanting all of us to see that rejection of absolutism does not necessarily automatically lead to rejection of universalism. Universalism still remains an extremely important part of all our morality. Similarly, objectivity and subjectivity have to be understood in many ways. We may reject objectivity in the sense of being entrenched and decided factually by nature out there. But are we going to reject objectivity and accept subjectivism in the, in, in the sense that I like it and therefore it is right for me? Roti and nobody is going to accept this kind of a subjectivism and will have to admit of a certain kind of an objectivity over there. So the meanings of the term universal, objective, absolute are very, very carefully to be uh, brought forward. A good understanding of Rorty has to be uh, done in this way because, you know, uh, when Rahul was responding to the fact that, you know, is he a cultural relativist? And he said, oh, he's, he said that he doesn't, isn't, isn't a cultural relativist. The fact is, you have to show how he is not a cultural relativist. The other very important question, which I think we need to go again back to the masters. If we look at Descartes, the, again, the much maligned father of modernity, the much maligned father of uh, enlightenment or one of the fathers of enlightenment or the other. When he is talking about consciousness, consciousness to him means the whole range from reason to, to sen sensation 
to feeling to emotion. The whole range of things is consciousness contrasted with something which has only extension, which is matter. So the binary is between materiality and consciousness. The binary is not between reason and emotion. This imposition of reason and emotion binary has to be substantiated. It's a pity that most of the scholars, even in philosophy, start following sociologists and other people who are reading a different kind of a literature. We have to read our own literature. When have reason and emotion been separated and by whom and where? They have been separated in certain cases, as in the case of Rousseau, but not in the case of Descartes. And where have been they been separated in the case of Rousseau? There again, we have to take a closer look. And people who are now doing care ethics have to see that can they reject wholesale the whole framework with which Rousseau was working? I, as a feminist, I, as a Democrat, find many things extremely objectionable in Kant. I find them extremely objectionable in uh, Aristotle. I also find them extremely objectionable in Rousseau. But when I come to my own activism I, as a feminist, I utilize the theory of Aristotle's capability using Amartya Sen and uh, Martha Nussbaum. I use Kant without his uh, misogyny expressed in theory and practice, but his principle of treating everybody as a means to an end and not an, an, uh, as an end in himself and not as a means to an end, and use the Kantian framework of universality to my own advantage. I also use the philosophy of language of Austin, illocutionary act, perlocutionary act, to my own advantage. So the feminists as activists are using all of that. But the point is that here in a philosophical discourse, if Rorty is working as a philosopher, which he's not. Interestingly, he is rejecting the philosophical discourse wholesale. But the point is, if Rorty were to be treated philosophically, and if Rorty's analysis is to be treated with some kind of a serious philosophical interest, then we have to see that when he's contrasting reason and sentiment and saying, that we do not need to go to objectivist, rationalist, uh, impersonal idea. We need to go to a more personal, sentimental idea. Then we have to say, hey, 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 wait a minute. If it is a part of a philosophical discourse, we were not making this distinction. Two, are we not running the risk of the same kind of a risk which you are hinting at? They're going back into binaries, either sentiment or reason. Why can't we have both? Why can't we uh, have an, a fuller understanding? Because most of the things that Rorty is now claiming are very well taken care of in the old debate of the 1960s, 1920s to the 1960s within the analytical fold. There are no natural necessities following Quine there and Putnam. There are all, all necessities are related to convention. There is a distinction between facticity and value. Value statements cannot be completely reduced into factual statements, as has been very well given to us by Moore. Does not mean that factual statements have no bearing on uh, value statements. So what is human need? How that human beings are flesh and blood animals, that human beings are desiring animals, that human beings have a sense of value. These are facts which actually make it possible for us to do the value discourse. Within this value discourse, when we talk about all human beings being equal and all human beings being worthy of equal respect and dignity and certain values being more conducive to them rather than other, these are the functional kind of things which are again to be factually borne out. Kant had, though he had been a great champion of the categorical imperative, he had always said that the moral principle, when it applies to a particular thing, will have to be implied, have to, will have to be applied through other 
human capabilities taste intuition tact so just as in the case of metaphysics he had said that the general categories when they are applied to particular need something like schematism here also the general moral rule whether it applies to this particular case will have to have many other features so what you require is a huge amount and this is the kind of thing which you find in rm hare in austin in uh, all the uh, so called analytical uh, theorists who are talking about morality that actually you need empirical information you need a general moral principle and then an application to a specific case uh i am extremely delighted that uh, 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 um, rahul takes uh, roti seriously but i invite him to think uh, once again on the issue that when we are to get uh, uh, that is this idea that human rights are actually a self fulfilling framework human rights are constructivist ideas it's not a unique idea only to uh, to roti the whole pragmatist tradition the whole tradition in the past 20 30 years this is the framework in which we are working the further question is but can we just take it as historical the idea is that it may be historically positioned but we have to see that in some or the other way we have to talk about its ideality its aspirational value we are and committed to see that these rights are governed of them that the un has been hypocritical that the western uh, west has been sometimes hegemony again i think this is an oversimplification not all west has rep is represented by the western transnational capitalistic uh, governments the uh, now to uh, the west to me might mean chomsky the west to you might mean donald trump the way america to roti means walt whitman and john dewey america to somebody else might mean only the transnational corporation so this kind of a generalization that the west is doing this east is doing this is also something which is really uh, problematic the hegemonic idea of human rights is actually something which is generally said by people who have neither read philosophical discussions nor bothered to read the human rights charter uh when you look at there is a progressive nature in uh the human rights uh, discourse the consensus uh, the human rights are arrived at only by the consensus of the globe the fact is uh they they are constituted not by consensus but arrived at by consensus and what they are constituted by is actually the aspiration that we have so i Uh, appreciate what rahul is underlining a uh, true uh, illustration from uh, richard rorty that human being is something that we want to become but the question cannot be just left at here why do we want to become like that some people would would say that we want to become like that because it leads to better society now, or now again what does a better society mean is based upon certain normative principles so the whole discourse discourse is now within the framework of what we call philosophical anthropology and therefore we need to see that how this discourse relates to the traditional discourse and very quick kind of uh, uh, discussions which dub the whole thing as a product of enlightenment dub it as rationalistic dub it as abstract forget that the abstraction had been brought in for certain purposes what was the earlier theory the earlier theory was there are three kinds of people the kings are of certain kind the men of gold are a certain kind the men of brass are of certain kind the triguna theory and all of that contesting that we were trying to say that no we do not want to hold to those the, the, these theories we want to have let us take a minimal idea of human being where all human beings are regarded as equal in terms of their need for food clothing shelter and their deserving of respect now this desert, this desert of respect as human being 
So sometimes you want to have a very thin theory of the self as against a thick theory of self, which takes about human being. The obvious answer is descriptively no. To sabhi human being ko equal Q treat kiya jai. Only because we have a normative definition. Now that normative definition has to be based upon a very minimalistic idea. And that is what we have been seeing. If you would look at most of the political discussion right now, whether it is in Ambedkar or whether it is uh, in other th theories in Rawls, it is a thin theory of the self. If you will have a thick theory of self that I am a Muslim lesbian living in Hyderabad. Now, if in that thickly layered theory, if that is going to decide all principles of morality, then there is a trouble. But the problem is, I must also be impacted by the thin theory of self. So the thin theory of self will provide you with a big, larger framework. And when it is applied to a specific co context, then you need something more than just the theory. Philosophy by its very nature, actually, very modestly, till the time of the analytical philosophers, confined itself to the thin theory of the self and abstraction. It was not that they were not aware of cultural relativity. It was not that they were not aware of the layered idea of human beings. Aristotle, the big uh, name in philosophy, did a huge amount of human uh, as well as animal research. But when he talks about metaphysics, he talks about, let us talk about being qua being. Then he talks about phronesis, poesis, praxis, and for each one of them, there is a separation. I am inviting the very thin community, the very sparse community of philosophy students and teachers to please take on this responsibility of taking on the philosophical task further. There are very great sociologists. There are very great activists. There are very great feminists. There are very great uh, economists. And they have brought in much to the discourse of human rights. Let us as philosophers bring the philosophical acumen that we have from our philosophical history to the discourse. And I'm extremely grateful that today an attempt has been made by Rahul to bring something to the plate. And I, although I do think that some of the exasperation expressed by Richard Rorty is not from philosophers, but from practitioners. From practitioners, and practitioners do not listen to philosophers. That's another story. But since the philosophers are not heard by the practitioners, their sore philosophers should give up doing philosophy is something which I do not believe. And I think that the hope and respect, the two uh, twin ideas which inspire the entire uh, philosophy of Richard Rorty should continue to inspire us. Uh, I'm extremely unhappy that I'm actually in, in a virtual mode. When we sit together, look at each other in the eye, we always get something more out of it. And I hope that we'll have more opportunities to discuss that. Uh, I thank the Department of uh, Philosophy, Benares Hindu University, uh, my very dear friend, Professor Anand Mishra, uh, all other members of the faculty, and my very, very dear young colleague, Rahul, for giving me an opportunity to listen to this enlightening talk and also share some of my concerns on the issue. Thank you. Thank you. At the very outset, I convey my best regard to our versatile genius chairperson, Professor Rakesh Chandra, who is the center of this seminar. Because and he is the real observer of this seminar. Because whatever speaker 
spoken about and the participant listened about but the main focus is that whether both speaker and participant communicate with each other or the intellectual communication happen or not that made by the chairperson and he really he made the re strong bridge between both speaker and the participant as well as he also made the offer bridge in the sense he had added he has added some important points which are need to be fixed in the paper or the participant what they intended to ask that clarify on the basis of his our bridge so thank you so much sir for your important observation as well as spending us sometimes and sharing your important times and value of your life so we are so benefited from you really thank you so much sir and then i would like to thank the speaker dr rk maurya really he has chosen the important very you can say vibrant topic that means what we the people are really seeking in this present era somehow he has try to convince us such a way and in his paper he has taken the view from different angle from one from analytic another from not pure analytic like roti sometimes you can say continental thinker but what they have made or that means you can say uh constructed the view that so much convenient to us of course we understood and we can imply in our research activities as well as in our regular activities thank you so much sir for choosing this such important topic and spending your valuable time in this prestigious job and then let us think for our sod thank you so much sir for your constant support and giving us courage and creating some sort of confidence within us to continue this prestigious job for the benevolent of our profession and not only it's restricted to our profession rather it's extended to our extend extended towards the society benevolence of the society it's really important and useful for all of us and thank you sir thank you so much sir for your kind support and then i should thank to the convener of this seminar because uh, she is the important part because he she collected us or she invited us to sit together and focus on a particular point of view and try to learn something for our further observation of our for Uh, the purpose observation of the purpose of our life and he she successfully done her job and then very important factor of this seminar is the art audience participants those who participants from online and offline thank to all of them because they are the important pillar of this successful seminar if we Think that our success, our seminar is so successful because of them. Because whatever the speaker is saying, that's not a matter of fact. That is that whether that can be understood understood by us or we are able to understand or not. And how can you know when we participate or communicate with the speaker? So it is an academic platform. and seminar activities so participants are most essential the essential part of seminar is participants so thank you all the participants from i can say east to west and uh, online to offline 
for your attention and rigorous participation and valuable query and questions. Thank you so much. And at last I can say thank you one and all those who are here. Thank you. Now it's over to our convener. Thank you, Dr. Rajibo. And with the permission of chair and the HOD, uh, I end this session. Uh, thank you all for joining us today.